different events, interactive demos, and direct access to INE instructors and industry experts. You'll find it all on INE Live. Regular online streams bringing you the latest industry news, insider info, and the newest technology. You drive the conversation, you bring the questions. We'll deliver the answers and info you want to hear. Get instant access to INE Live on our website, INE.com, or on whatever social media platform you use. Be sure to like and follow us for notifications when we are live. We'll see you there. You lead by innovating, and keeping up with the latest technology isn't enough. You need to stay ahead of it. That's where we come in. INE offers the most in-depth, hands-on training experience in the industry. Our world-class expert instructors guide your team through complex training modules, arming them with the knowledge they need to protect your critical infrastructure, build and maintain your networks, and make cloud migration seamless. Dive into thousands of hands-on labs for unlimited practice in real-world scenarios and feel confident your networks won't be compromised with a zero-risk lab sandbox that allows your team to learn on our network, keeping yours secure. Our business platform is simple to use because it's all about you. Customize your training experience with INE's exclusive playlist. Drop courses and labs into individualized streams Assign them out and keep up with progress, ensuring team members get the training they need and you get the expertise you need. Single sign-on makes logging in quick and easy across teams, and API access allows you to integrate course catalog materials directly into your LMS. Advanced analytics give you actionable insight into where your team excels and where they're vulnerable. And our courses are constantly evolving as technology changes. While businesses grow at the speed of technology, we give your team the tools to stay ahead of it. Get started with INE for Business today.
Hello and welcome to INE Live. I'm your host Keith Bogart and today we're going to be conducting an open Q&A between myself and my guest Rohit Partisani. We'll be talking about our backgrounds as networking instructors, our preferences and opinions when it comes to noteworthy technical concepts and a lot more. Before we start, we'd like you to know that we're streaming live across LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. We'd also like to point out that this is an open Q&A and that we'll soon be answering audience questions from you submitted through chat. Our moderators are monitoring chat across all the platforms, so if you have a question, be sure to start it with a Q so that we can find them easily. With that, let me formally introduce myself and my guest for today. So, as I mentioned, I'm Keith Bogart. I've been with INE for uh, about eight years at this point, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, before that, I worked at Cisco for about 17 years. And my specialties as an instructor and content developer are in the CCNA and CCNP enterprise space. And Rohit, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Keith. It's a pleasure being here with you and with all you guys watching us. Well, I am Rohit Pardasani. I have been in the industry for about 20 years now and uh, with about 18 years of focus mainly being on Cisco. I do have a lot of certifications. Um, my main certifications being CCI. I have five of them, CCI Route Switch, which is now Enterprise, and Security Service Provider Voice and Collaboration. All right, thank you very much. All right, so um, Rohit and I have already prepared some questions for each other, and of course, we're gonna take some questions from you as well. So I'll go ahead and start it out by asking a thoroughly embarrassing question for Rohit. Not really, but uh, so can you tell us how you first became in, uh, interested in networking? Uh, that's an interesting story that it actually goes back to 1997. So back in the day, I didn't know anything about networking. It was mainly, uh, I was mainly looking at things like uh, doing some programming courses. I was always interested in, in IT or computers back in the day. Mm -hmm. So I did some C, C++, Java courses, and um, I could not understand that. Mm -hmm. It was something beyond me, and I was like, I don't really know what to do. That's when I heard some two other guys talking about networking, mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, what is networking, you know? Mm -hmm. And I went back and researched, and at that time I learned something about Microsoft, it was Windows NT back then, and there was something called a CCNA. Mm. So I did the Windows NT course, I got certified for that, and I did my CCNA, and I liked CCNA a lot. Back when it had like Token Ring and Fiddy and yep. Frame Relay and all those good things yep. on it, yeah. I could understand that, and it was easy, so I was like, you know what, I really like this. It's something which is not like programming, which is kind of coming back to haunt me now. Mm. But yes, I mean, I did my CCNA back in 1998. And it was something I really liked. And yeah. that's how my career started with Cisco being the main vendor. Yeah. And I just went on with that. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, there is a question uh, in the, the chat here. There are actually several questions in the chat. So. Let's see here. Uh, why don't we start with, um, I, go for, I go from YouTube, and sorry, I go if I'm, or Ago if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, asks how Rohit and myself prepare themselves for our first CCIE. Uh, so I'll just talk a little bit about my experience a little bit, and then I'll bounce it back to you for that. So uh, my first CCIE is sort of an interesting story because I was working at Cisco at the time, um, I had zero networking experience whatsoever. I was actually working in customer service at Cisco. And I thought, uh, I had some experience with the Cisco sales engineers and I thought, I'd like to get into that area. How would I do that? And I was told, well, if you go into Cisco's technical assistance center and you can survive there for a year or a year and a half, you'll be well prepared to become a systems engineer. So I talked to a TAC manager and got myself in there knowing nothing about networking, but at that time they had uh, a team within the TAC that was sort of perfectly suited for what I was doing. So they gave me a big stack of books and I started learning and within that TAC team, it was sort of like a badge of honor 
to get your CCIE. You know, people, it seemed like every other week, you know, we were having a party for someone getting their CCIE. So there was a lot of pressure to get a CCIE. CCNA, CCNP wasn't even talked about. They were just going straight for their CCIE. So I just started studying the books. I started um, doing some labs and there were no virtual labs back then. There was a real physical lab with just a nightmare of cabling and half the stuff didn't work. And I just bugged my fellow employees uh, incessantly with questions. And uh, probably after about seven or eight months of that, and of course studying you know, at night, I got my CCIE, which was in Dial ISP Technologies back then. So that's how I got my first one. So Rohit, what's your story? Well, my first CCIE was the CCIE routing switching. And again, that's a funny story because when I did my CCNA in 98, um, like I really enjoyed Cisco or CCNA, I went and did my CCNP in route switch. And when I did that, I was like, you know what, I've done CCNP now and I'm really great. That's when I heard about CCIE. I didn't know anything about CCIE. And back in the days, there was not much documents or nothing really available to actually study. So it was, it's a funny story because uh, in 2003, I started studying for my first CCIE. And um, I actually used INE. So it's come back to a full circle. Mm -hmm. That, so back in the days, it was INE's workbooks and they had uh, rack rentals and everything. Mm -hmm. So I went to eBay and I bought a bunch of those 2500 series routers. Yeah, I did that too. And bought them and uh, started practicing. So when I, when I actually got those devices, I, I needed something to practice on. And I used the INE workbooks back in the days. In fact, I still have those those big books that I used to ship you because mm -hmm. they didn't have like a e-copy workbook. They had those big books back in the days. Yeah. I still have them and I use that and I passed in the first attempt. And, and I'm sure lots of people wonder this because I get this question as well a lot in other shows and stuff, which is when you think about a Cisco exam, whether it be the CCNA or even the CCIE, which has such a broad range of topics in it, a question that I frequently hear is, how do you memorize all that stuff so that you can eventually sit and pass the exam? Because people say, hey, I'm six months into studying and I already forgot the stuff I learned in month number one. So what techniques did you use to keep all that stuff in your brain so you could eventually pass the test? Read, deploy, troubleshoot, repeat. Okay. So the, how I study, I mean, it's, it's, I cannot just read a book and okay, I know OSPF or I know this topic. I cannot just read. I need to lab it up. Lab it up is, is like the key factor for you to pass any exam. Yeah. Like for example, maybe in CCNP there are small simulations, but from a CCI perspective, you really need to lab stuff up. So what I did was I would read something, let's say a topic, maybe OSPF or BGP. I would, I would read about that. And once I read, I would then go and lab it up. I would do it two or three times. You don't really need a big topology. Let's say, for example, if you're learning about uh, establishing OSPF neighborship, yeah. you need two routers That's right. or maybe three. So I would lab it up, then I would break it and look at the debugs to see what messages do I get if, let's say, I configure authentication on one side and I don't configure authentication on the remote side. What do I get? What messages do I get? That really helped me understanding the OSPF packets, mm -hmm. the flow, and how it actually works. Right. So I would read, then I would lab it up, then I would break it, and then do exactly the same thing. Yep, absolutely. Uh, there's another question here from Luis H. on YouTube, and I'm going to give this question to you as well, uh, who asks, is it still worth it? to become a CCNP or a CCIE with a revolution of technology like automation. So are we basically uh, becoming a dinosaur? How would you answer that? So that's a really good question and I get asked that question quite a lot. So it is still relevant. The key difference being is if you look at CCIE 10 years back, you were considered God. Okay, you have a CCIE, that's amazing. Now. Does it have lower value from back then? Maybe yes, but is it of value? Yes. 
Because if you look at from perspective of there are thousands of people applying for a job, what, what differentiates you from, from a person who is somebody else who doesn't have a certification? It's your CCI certification. Absolutely. So CCI certification puts your foot in the door. It doesn't guarantee you a job. You still need to know your stuff. But it just helps the recruiters identify you that, okay, you know, he's a CCI, so let's give him a chance. As far as automation is concerned, automation is the future, yes. But again, what can you automate if you don't know how it works? Right. Like, for example, if I need to automate BGP, I need to know how it works to do something with automation. Right. So the way of doing it has changed, but not what you're doing. Right. You still need to know how BGP works mm -hmm. for you to do something with automation. So maybe I don't go and configure it manually. That's changed. But the concept of BGP hasn't changed. Exactly. And it's uh, like you driving a car, right? Like you should know Absolutely. how to drive a car, even if you're driving an automated car, but you still need to know how to drive that car, Absolutely. the basics of that. Yep. And one thing I'll also add to that is that, uh, especially at the CCNP and the CCIE levels, is when you look at the topics that are included in there and the scope of topics, keep in mind that those exams are really geared towards large enterprise environments, right? Mm -hmm. Really huge networks where you would probably expect to find automation because you're talking about hundreds or thousands of switches and routers and stuff. But there's a lot of networks in the world that don't fall into that category. There's a lot of small office, home office networks. There's a lot of medium, you know, there's a lot of networks out there where the, the company has 100, 200, 300 people where it really doesn't make sense for them to buy up $200,000 DNA automation solution or something else where they are still using the command line to configure routing and switching to get their you know wireless access points and controllers set up. So they still need somebody who knows what you learn at the CCNP and CCIE level. Um, and automation doesn't cover all of it, right? And yeah. what if the automation fails, right? Automation, ultimately you have some control that's running on a server somewhere. Servers can fail, your automation tool application can fail and now if you want to get something done while someone's troubleshooting that if nobody knows the command line or how to debug what are you going to do so absolutely yeah. that's still relevant i mean sending configs to thousands of routers it makes sense doing automation but like i had a friend who was troubleshooting multicast and uh, at the end of the day you still have to go and log in and and see the commands and see what's really happening behind the scenes before I can even send some command and get outputs. Yes, it's nice to get the outputs of thousands of routers, but if you know where the problem is, I would still need to go inside that router and see the debugs or the show commands to actually know. So you have to really know. So automation plays an, um, a good role with you knowing your stuff. You still have to know your stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the bearded IT dad asks, who should get the CCIE? Give me a name. Who should get the CCIE? No, I think what? I should get one more. Oh, you should get one more? Okay, that leads me to another question, but I'm gonna hold off on that. So, uh, do you, how would you answer that? I mean, anybody who's looking at uh, getting into the industry, getting a good job, I would say that, yeah, I mean, not just CCIE, any certification. Certification plays an important role mm -hmm. in getting your foot in the door, you know, because if I, yes, I mean, if you have like tens and 15 years of experience, then yeah, maybe I won't look at certification. But if I don't know you and uh, you're just coming, uh, you're just starting fresh, why would I hire you? I mean, you need to have something to show. Right. And that's where certification comes in. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question a, a LinkedIn user is asking for me, uh, which is, with so much to learn in the networking space, how can one stay fresh on different topics as with, uh, and getting deep, as getting deep knowledge gets away quickly? So that's a great question. So um, clearly you have to dedicate some time to do this. Uh, just like when you're studying for a certification, you know, if you're gonna be successful in studying for a certification, ultimately getting that exam, you have to dedicate an hour, two hours every single day to doing that. Now, 
Now let's say you're done. You got that exam, you walked out of the testing center, woohoo, I got that exam test, okay? So to stay relevant and to stay on top of new technologies, you need to still have that same mindset. Now maybe not to the same degree of an hour or two hours every single day, but I would definitely recommend getting into the mindset of maybe every single day from 1.30 until 2. That is my time slot to dig into the, the online networking periodicals, the online networking blogs, and just to see what's going on out there to you know keep abreast of the situation and what features and things are coming out with. And maybe as you're going through that, you'll find something that really piques your curiosity, piques your interest that you wanna dig in a little bit deeper and find out how it works. But just spending 20, 30 minutes every single day doing something like that, scanning Reddit, scanning, like I talked about, blogs and periodicals and newspapers, well, online newspapers, uh, would be probably the best way to stay on top of that type of stuff. Um, yeah, any, any other advice to go along with that? I think it makes sense that uh, you just need to practice. If you want to retain the knowledge, yeah, reading a book really helps. Mm -hmm. But would you retain that one month from now? No. But if you practice like three, four times, you retain it for much longer. Absolutely. So practicing or labbing it up is the key factor. Yep. I have a question for you, Keith. Okay. Um, which certification did you find the hardest to achieve? Oh, absolutely, the CCIE. CCIE? Uh, yeah, so definitely. And for me, probably the biggest reason why that's true is because I, I found at the CCNA level, the topics that are in there were very relevant, right? You learn about your routing protocols, you learn about your spanning tree, you learn about your access list, things that you would find in most networks out there that, that most network engineers would need to know. But at the CCIE level, I found that there were a lot of questions and topics on what I would call corner case scenarios, uh, which I had never heard of when I thought to myself, would I ever use this? The chances were probably not. <laughs> but those were the things that were the most challenging for me to master and get my mind around. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Let's see. So there's a question. Um, Here's a good question. So how did you manage to do so many CCIEs, Rohit? Because you have several. So when I did my first one, I was extremely happy that I passed my CCIE routing switching in the first attempt. And um, the thing was that I spent, I mean, two years before for studying, but my actual studying happened in the last one year before my actual lab exam attempt. So for one year, all I was doing was reading, labbing, reading, labbing, troubleshooting, just doing that. By the time I finished my first CCIE and I passed, I was happy, I realized I didn't really have any friends left. <laughs> you know, it was like there was so much time in my hand because I had nothing to do because that's all I did for one year. So I was like, okay, you know what? Since everything is so fresh, let's just do one more CCIE. <laughs> I will do service provider. And because the difference between route switch and service provider was not that much. So I chose service provider and I did that in like six to eight months because there was not a big lift from route switch to service provider. So that's how I did my second one. But by the time I finished my second CCIE, again, that was in first attempt, um, it became more of like a prestige kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, I want one more CCIE. Mm -hmm. And this time it was security. So I chose security, which was completely different. I didn't know anything about security, not even CCNA level, level of knowledge for security. Mm -hmm. So I started studying for that and took about two years to learn about different technologies, VPN, ASA, mm -hmm. I believe that back then there was IPS and IDS. So learn about that and I did my third CCIE, which was again in the first attempt. Yeah. And once I got my third one, I was like, okay, you know what? That's it. 
yeah. no more CCIs. But then, you know, I was doing training, so I wanted to learn more technologies. That's when voice came. Voice was brutal. It took me three attempts. The first time, I did not pass. That's what's basically CCIE collaboration now, right? Now it's collaboration, yeah. yeah. So it was voice back then. I, I did my CCIE voice. I was super confident going into the lab. And uh, I get my result. It was fail. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest mistake that people make when they fail a lab exam is that they wait for one year between attempts. And that's the biggest mistake that you can make because the thing for CCIE is that you've read so much, you've practiced so much, you've labbed so much, you have the speed and ability to configure stuff. But uh, if you wait for one month or one year, everything is gone. You've lost that speed, you've lost that flow of studying, yeah. you have to start all over again. And that's the mistake I didn't want to make. So I rebooked my lab exam one month from my first attempt. And that actually dovetails perfectly into a question from uh, Gio Campos from YouTube, who said that they just failed their first attempt at the CCIE uh, enterprise infrastructure and they want some advice. So clearly part of your advice is don't wait a year. Don't wait a year. Again. Any other advice you'd give that person? Yeah, so I booked my lab exam my second attempt again in one month. I looked at the, my score sheet and I looked at where did I lose points? Uh, did I, how much time did I take to complete the lab? Um, I was clearly slow in completing the lab. I didn't have enough time to verify or do any troubleshooting or even look at all the questions again. So clearly speed was my problem. So then that one month, I worked on the technologies that I was weak at and practice, 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 build speed, yeah. re-attempted. The second attempt, I actually finished my lab in six and a half hours. But I was so confident, I didn't check anything. I just got up and left. Mm -hmm. I get my result. It was fail again. And I was like, no, the system is broken. <laughs> you know, I cannot fail. So I rebooked my lab exam, third attempt. This time, again, I finished in six hours. And the last two hours, I sat there, rechecked every question from the start to see if I made any typos or something. Yeah. I rechecked everything. I got my result. It was pass. So it took me three attempts to pass voice. And then I was like, OK, I'm finally done with CCIs. And let's move on to other certifications like Juniper. Let's look at Palo Alto, do Checkpoint. So I did all of that. And then Cisco announced that Voice is going to retire. And then you have a choice of doing either giving the written exam for Voice and sending an email to Cisco that will convert my Voice to collaboration mm -hmm. or attempt, attempting the collaboration lab exam and uh, retaining both. So I chose the second option. I was like, let's go and attempt the lab exam for collaboration. And if I pass, I pass. If I, do, if I don't pass, I will send an email to Cisco saying convert my voice to collaboration. And I went and booked my lab on a Monday for a Friday. Zero preparation. Mm. On a Monday for a Friday, I flew down, gave the lab attempt. I finished the lab in eight hours that the proctor had to kick me out. And uh, got my result. It was pass. That's awesome. So. Yeah. I got to keep both voice and collaboration. That's nice. So yeah, that's how I've actually got so many certifications. Yeah. Uh, I just like learning things, learning new technologies. It's just interesting. And you know, something you said reminds me of another tip I would give uh, as far as, you know, I failed an exam, what do I do now? And this would not only pertain to the CCIE, but CCNA, CCNP as well, is I think a common mistake that people do is, you know, they get that message, you know, they're sitting there, they get the printout, they failed, they leave the testing center, they get in their car or the bus or the train, whatever, they go home, and, and then if they think about it by the time they get home, 
then they start sitting down and making a list of the, th the topics that they failed on. And that's a great idea. I absolutely recommend you make that list, but here's the problem. They waited until they got home. And by that time, you've already forgotten a lot of the stuff that you failed on. So what I always recommend, and I actually do this myself, is when I walk out of that testing center knowing that I failed, I get in my car and before I go anywhere, before I even turn on the car, except maybe to turn on the air conditioning, I whip out my cell phone or my tablet, I close my eyes, I turn on like a voice recording feature and I just sit back and I say, okay, there's a question on there about uh, frame relay Delsies I missed. There was a question on there about QoS with SD-WAN, I missed that one. And I just do a verbal brain dump of all the topics that I missed on that exam or that I think I missed because you don't know exactly, right? But I get that on, a ver on an audio recording then once I can't think of anything, then I turn it off and drive home. Because if I drive home and then try doing that, I won't be able to create nearly yep. as long of a list for myself. So I would definitely recommend that people do that as well. Like I said, CCNA C up to the CCIE, um, you want to make that list for yourself of the things that you know that you m messed up on. Yeah, I mean, you can be negative about it that I failed. But you know what? On that score sheet, there's a lot of information mm -hmm. which tells you about just the general domains that you scored less on. Focus on those things. Right. So if you focus on that, you can definitely pass either the lab exam or even any CCNP exam that you want to give. Yep. There's another good question uh, in here from, let's see here. This is the one I was going to, from uh, Kostas Ianu from YouTube. Once again, hopefully I got your name correct. The question is, the future is network security. There have been a lot of cyber attacks lately. What do you think? So I have some thoughts on that, but I want to hear your thoughts first. What do you think? I mean, it's, it's a cat and mouse game, right? Uh, sometimes the cyber side or the hacker side is ahead. Sometimes we are ahead. So it's a constant learning. You have to constantly learn new technologies, new ways of defending your network. So a cool thing, like a simple thing, like I was doing, I just recently finished the CCI security lab course for our students. Right. And I was learning about Stealth Watch. There was a really cool lab that I demonstrated in that where, okay, you know what, if you are using like a rogue DNS server, because sometimes, you know, you may connect to a rogue DNS server or a rogue DHCP server. There are many things that you can do to mitigate those simple issues. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you keep yourself open, obviously you may get attacked or hacked. So I did, I did a really cool lab where if you are using a rogue DHCP server or if you're not using a legitimate DNS approved DNS server, the stealth watch is going to instruct ICE to basically reduce his privileges and ICE is going to tell the switch that, okay, he doesn't, he no more has permit IP any any. Right. He has lower privileges because he's using a wrong DNS server or maybe a rogue DHCP server. Mm -hmm. So there are so many things that you can do, but you have to learn that, right? Right. So with, with security, you have to constantly learn new ways, new technologies to defend your network. Yeah. You cannot be stuck on just VPN. Right. And another thing that I would add to that is that, you know, a lot of times people are saying, you know, I, I got my CCNA, what do I do now? Should I branch out into data centers, cybersecurity, uh, collaboration? Um, and they're looking at it from the perspective of where are the jobs? Now, granted, there are a lot of job opportunities right now in cybersecurity, but I think the primary thing one needs to ask themselves is, where's my interest? I mean, if I'm thinking about, well, I really loved learning about routing and switching. I love learning about OSPF, BGP. I love learning about VLANs and all that stuff, but mm, cybersecurity is where it's at, so that's where I should probably go. If you start studying something that you don't have a passion for, that you're not really interested in, you're just doing it for the paycheck, it's gonna be real challenging for you, and even if you get that job, you're gonna be a stressed out nutball. You're gonna go home at night, you're gonna quickly lose your hair. Uh, it's gonna just not gonna be a fun environment for you. So I would say the first thing somebody should do is, you know, what am I truly interested in? I mean, there are plenty of jobs out there for routing and switching engineers. There's plenty of jobs out there for people in uh, the collaboration space, 
or in the network infrastructure security. You know, maybe you don't want to go into cybersecurity, but there's still a lot of stuff for network security. So if cybersecurity is really a passion for you, absolutely pursue that. Um, there are a lot of jobs for that. But if you think about that and you say, you know what, and, and I would, you know, even if you're not sure, investigate it, right? Look at the topics on the various exams, the things that you would have to learn. And if you say, well, you know, those 35 things in the blueprint, I can see that maybe seven or eight of them might be kind of interesting, but, you know, 15 of them are just stuff like, I have no interest in learning that. I just don't want to go down that road. Don't waste your time learning something and pursuing a certification exam that doesn't provide you some fulfillment. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point that, the key point is to learn something to know it, you know, like a lot of people would be like, okay, I know OSPF a bit, I know BGP a bit, I know automation or let's say Python a bit. The way I like to learn it is I will not move on to the next topic till I cannot master one topic. Yeah. Like I need to know it. So the key point is there are jobs everywhere, whether it's route switch or enterprise or security. Like for example, even wireless has lots of jobs. Mm -hmm. I don't have interest in wireless, that's why I'm not pursuing that, mm -hmm. right? So there are jobs everywhere. As long as you know your stuff mm -hmm. in whatever field, whatever track, whatever domain you go to, as long as you know it, yeah. you'll be able to find a job. And one could always learn, one could always study for uh, enterprise infrastructure or collaboration. There's nothing stopping you from spending a little bit of time learning about cybersecurity as well. You don't have to go full blown and pursue a cybersecurity certification to learn about cybersecurity. As a matter of fact, I think someone who's hiring a network engineer would probably appreciate someone more who's a little bit more well-rounded. And that actually goes into a question here, uh, which is a LinkedIn user asks, with organizations looking for talent across multiple domains, like networking, virtualization, server stuff, cloud, security, et cetera, how can one be proficient in all domains? And I'll mention, I'll talk about that briefly and then I'll hand that over to you as well. So first of all, you have to realize when you're, when you're looking you know, on LinkedIn or, or at any job posting and they, they list like 25 different bullets of, this is what we were looking for. That's always the wish list, right? Anybody will say, hey, if you're gonna post a job for a network engineer or whatever, give like your pie in the sky of what you're looking for. You know, ideally, would they like to find someone who's got those 15 different skill sets and who's an expert in all of them? Absolutely, they, they would. But realistically, if they actually found somebody like that, they probably couldn't afford to pay them what they're offering. So don't be too stressed if, you know, you don't meet every single one of those bullet points. But absolutely, you do want to have some knowledge and experience across more than one domain. And that's why I said that, you know, while you are... Uh, pursuing a certification or even after you've gotten a certification. Let's say you're, you're done with your CCIE enterprise infrastructure, just to pick that one. You don't have to pursue the CCIE collaboration in order to get some experience in multicast and video and voice and collaboration tools. You can still learn that stuff, lab that stuff, and get some experience on that stuff without going full blown and getting a certification on it. Um, so absolutely you want to get some experience across multiple domains, but you don't have to go super, super deep in all of them. What would you say? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, like you said, that choose one topic where you need to be an expert in. And when you find jobs, let's say if a job listing says that routing switching engineers, if you're an expert in routing switching, you can look at that job. Yes, do they have a wish list of, okay, he should know virtualization, he should know firewalls. If you have even 10 to 15% knowledge of multiple verticals, mm -hmm. but you're an expert in one vertical, it makes sense. You yeah. can go for that job, where, which is mainly your vertical, and always learn more technologies to complement that. Yeah. Like you don't have to be an expert in routing switching also, and security also, and cybersecurity also because those kind of guys don't exist. Yeah. It's not really possible yeah. to know all the domains mm -hmm. and be an expert. So if you're gonna be like, I'm gonna be an expert in all the domains, it's going to be 50 years from now. Yeah. It would take you 50 years. Versus choose one domain, be an expert in that, and then complement that with 20% knowledge of different, different things. 
which yeah. can help you learn more. Right. And even if you're one of those rare people out there, and I've known some of these people who can read a book and memorize everything in the book, they're like, what do they call that when you can read something and instantly retain it? Um, there's a term for that. Yeah. I can't re remember what that is. That was Mike Ross in Suits. Well, there you go. So even if you're somebody like that, the key to being successful as an engineer is being able to synthesize all those things. Uh, for example, you have to know how does this feature integrate with this other feature? How will these things work together? If something's broken, what are all the possible reasons why it could be broken so I can get to my root cause and analyze that? Being able to simply memorize all the stuff in cybersecurity, all the stuff in cloud, all the stuff in enterprise is not gonna get you to that point where you can answer those types of questions. So here's a good question. Um, so what do you think of this? I go from YouTube asks, is it better to get two or three CCNPs or just one CCIE? I mean, it depends on the experience of the guy. So let's say if you were a fresher, I would go for a CCIE than three CCNPs. Um, because the three CCNPs is not really going to give me an extra leverage of salary perspective, mm -hmm. but the CCIE would. And, um, and everybody knows that, you know, CCNP, whether it's a CCNP enterprise, if you get that certification or even the CCNP security, you just need to have one. Knowledge of multiple is good, mm -hmm. but if you have just one CCNP certification, that's more than enough if you want to stop at that. But yes, you should gain knowledge of a bit of security also, a bit of something else also, but choose one domain again. CCI definitely would be my first choice rather than doing just three CCNPs. I would absolutely agree. I think from a, from a job market perspective, an employer would be more impressed and more liable to hire someone who has a CCIE than has two or three CCNPs in different categories. Now what I will add on to that, and, and tell me what you think about this, um, is that once you get a CCIE, let's, once again, let's just take enterprise infrastructure as an example, I think at that point, it might be more beneficial than, than to say, okay, now I'm gonna get a CCNP in security, stop there, now I'm gonna get another CCNP in uh, collaboration. So now you've got one CCIE and a couple of CCNPs in different areas because you could bang those out, those two CCNPs, you could probably bang those out faster than if you said, now I've got one CCIE, I'm gonna go for a second CCIE. Would yep. you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, get one CCI at least, and then if you want to branch out, do multiple CCNPs. Yep, absolutely. Well, let's see. Do you have any other questions you want to ask? I have a question for you. Surprise. What does certification mean to you, and how do you keep up? What does certification mean to me? Well, For me, I find it very difficult to have a regimented, regular study schedule if I'm not, if I don't have some goal in mind. Um, if I'm not preparing for a certification exam, I find it very difficult to be, to find the incentive to every single day sit down for an hour or two and study a bunch of stuff. Now, you know, if I'm creating a video course or creating a lab on something that I don't know or I haven't done in a long time, well then clearly I have to learn it for that. But that's one of the things I think is a value of a certification, whether it be Cisco or Juniper or whatever, is that it keeps me motivated to be structured and regimental when it comes to my learning. Um, certainly it's also good from an employment perspective, right? I mean, yep. it looks good on a resume. Um, Let's see, what else, is, what else could be a value of a certification? Yeah, those are the top things off the top of my head. Yeah, I think it makes sense that uh, keeping a regiment of the way you study is important. Mm -hmm. Like, for me, I cannot study at night. Some people love studying at night, but I cannot. The reason being, I cannot stay awake. Mm -hmm. I'm a morning guy, so mm -hmm. if I have to study, I have this pattern 
Like you asked me that question earlier about how did I achieve those five CCIs or so many right. CCIs. I have this kind of pattern. I'm kind of old school. So I have this pattern of waking up with Eye of the Tiger song <laughs> kind of playing. So that gives me the motivation of like, okay, I, I have to wake up and do some labbing or some studying. Wow, I wish I was like that. So Maybe I still do that. Coffee. If I have to learn something, I'll wake up at 4 a.m. where everybody is sleeping and I'm fresh. I will uh, start my day with Eye of the Tiger and then, you know, mm -hmm. bring up some routers and switches and firewalls and just play around with it. Yeah. You know, just a couple of hours, one or two hours, play around with that and that helps me learn. Yeah. One other thing that just came to my mind that I'll add as well is I th if you're, and this is especially true if you're studying once again for some kind of certification, CCNA all the way up to CCIE, is that one of the best ways to learn something is if you teach it to somebody else. And I found that as an instructor, you know, when I'm, I learn the best when I'm preparing all my notes and my slides for video course, uh, developing a lab. So I often recommend to people that when they are uh, preparing for a certification to get involved in some sort of study group. But ideally, the study group would have some element where everybody has an opportunity to teach everybody else. I don't know if that exists. If not, the study group you're in, you should suggest it. Uh, but I definitely think it's a great idea if somebody says, okay, so John, next week, you're gonna be responsible for teaching all of us something for 30 minutes. The week after that, Sally, you're responsible for teaching. And by putting somebody on the spot and saying, you're responsible for teaching this, come up with some basic slides, maybe come up with a, a lab task that we can all do. I think that is a really great, great way for learning things as well. Yep, that is really good. Yeah, I mean, look at you and Stealth Watch, right? Probably would yeah. have learned it if you didn't have to create labs for it to help everybody else out. Yep. yep. So here's a good question for you because you have the CCI security. So uh, Yasser Amini from LinkedIn asks, how is the CCIE security positioned compared to other security certifications like Palo Alto, Fortinet, and Checkpoint? Do you know any of those other ones? Can you speak to I that? I do. Um, I mean, I have the Palo Alto and Checkpoint certification, okay. but not FortiGit or Fortinet. But, um, I would say CCI security is still pretty relevant with all the new uh, companies that Cisco has acquired. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, the whole forte of it coming together, all the different products of Cisco, whether it's the web security appliance or the email security appliance combined uh, with uh, ICE and then StealthWatch for monitoring. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the product of Cisco or CCI security is pretty relevant. It was not for a very long time. Mm. If you look at a couple of years back, the CCI security of Cisco was not really relevant to the industry mm. and it was Palo Alto and Checkpoint was better. But I feel that having knowledge of Palo Alto and Checkpoint complements the CCI security. Mm. But um, just having Palo Alto or Checkpoint is not enough as a security engineer. When you, this sort of dovetails, I just thought of this, this sort of dovetails into that. So focusing on CCI security for a second, when you think of the very sort of generic topics that someone would need to become a, a network infrastructure security, I'm sort of saying that to differentiate that from cybersecurity, uh, an expert in that, and you think, okay, well that would involve knowledge of VPNs, that would involve knowledge of firewalls, you know, very, sort of generic bullet points. Would you say that the CCIE security exam covers those bullet points to a better degree than some of the other ones do? Yes. Okay. It does. And you know, you know what, coming back to something that I would like to share, uh, I didn't have knowledge of Checkpoint or Palo Alto before I did my CCIE security. And I've constantly been learning new technologies in the security domain. So when I moved, when I started learning about Checkpoint and Palo Alto, it didn't take me much time because the basic concept remains the same. Mm -hmm. Like for example, in Cisco, I may go to the command line and do stuff, or I may go to the GUI of FTD and do stuff, you know, but 
the basic concept that okay, if I need to block something, that blocking part remains the same. The GUI may be different, but the basic concept remains the same. So when I was uh, learning about Checkpoint, learning about Palo Alto, it was pretty much the same thing. Yeah. So it took me really, I was able to learn that really fast uh, because like I said, basics were the same. Yeah, it's just a very Like an access list is an access list. Yeah. Whether you call that access list in Cisco versus you apply that rule in Checkpoint. Mm -hmm. But the basic concept of restricting something is the same. Absolutely, yeah. The I GUI agree. may be different. I don't know if I can answer this question, but maybe you have. I, I'm, if not, then we can't. But this has to do with data center. So Afri P from YouTube asks, is there a bridge course to go from CCNA to CCNP data center? A bridge course. What so think? I think I would like to answer sure, this. Sure, please do. So once you do your CCNA, you can directly move to the CCNP data center track right. where you have the core exam and the concentration. Right. But my advice would be to do CCNA, then do the CCNP enterprise, maybe not the certification if you are interested in data center, but learn about the CCNP enterprise, the core topics mm -hmm. like your BGP, OSPF, learn about those things yeah. and then move on to data center for the certification track. So after CCNA, you can directly learn about CCNP Enterprise and then move on to data center, mm -hmm. give the concentration a core exam first, and then choose one of the concentrations that you are interested in. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So another question I have for you is, what is your strategy to learn a new networking or just new technology, period. What's your strategy to learn a new technology? Uh, lab. Like, I, I'll give you an example of StealthWatch again. Mm -hmm. A couple of months back, <clears throat> I didn't know much about it. I knew what StealthWatch is, but I didn't know how it works. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? The first thing I did was I built a lab. I installed StealthWatch. I installed other components like ICE, uh, switches, some routers, uh, some Windows PC. So made a lab environment. Then I started reading about what exactly is StealthWatch. How can it be integrated with ICE? Now I know ICE, right? So I was like, okay, if it integrates with ICE, what can I do with it? So I, tried it, I started playing around with it. So you play around with it, and you kind of get enough knowledge about it. Yeah, you may not know 100%, but it's enough for you to start learning about it. Yeah. You know, so I, I always learn, I cannot just read a book. If I read a book, yeah, I'll understand the concept, but I will not retain it. Right. I, I have to lap something up. And you know, that, that raises a really good point, is, is you've heard Rohit and I talk a lot about how getting hands-on experience and labbing something is critical to the learning process. Whether you're studying for a certification or you just want to learn a new technology. And sometimes people out there wonder, well, how am I going to do that? You know, I, I can't afford to go out and buy a bunch of new routers and switches and things like that. And so, you know, hopefully you, you guys who are watching already know this, but for the benefit of those who might not, um, so, you know, if you're an INE subscriber, we have labs now built into a lot of our you know, enterprise courses from the CCNA all the way up to the CCIE. And here's one thing that I, I want to emphasize about those labs. Now, when you pull up a lab for like Spanning Tree or OSPF or Stealth Watch or something like that, you know, we've got these, these steps, right? What we call lab tasks where it says, make this happen, make this happen, make this happen. But as you've heard Rohit and I talk a lot about, one of the best ways to learn is to experiment in a lab environment. Think to yourself, what would you like to accomplish? What would you like to break to see what happens when you break it? And our lab environments are also a perfect playground for that. So for example, if you're learning about OSPF as an example, you know, pull up one of our OSPF courses, 
pull up one of our OSPF labs, which will have a, a pre-built topology of whatever, six, seven, eight routers, which you can change, right? When you pull up our labs, you can modify the topology if you want to, but you can go in there and you can say, you know what, I'm going to ignore the lab task because I just want to play around with it. I want to break an OSPF relationship. I want to try to summarize routes in a certain way that I haven't thought about before. And so without you having to go out and spend tons of money on eBay or some Cisco partner or something, buying your own routers and switches and things, our lab environments are a great playground for you just to play around with. So you don't have to follow the specific tasks in order to do that. And I think you can gather from Rohit and I that that experimentation and that playing around is one of the best learning ways you can do. Yeah, you don't have to really practice if you're studying for a certification. It is for learning. Right. So whether it's for a CCIE or not, even if you're at the CCNA level, you need to lab it. Yes. So always configure something. It's important that you break it. I'll give you a simple example. When I was studying for my CCIE security, mm -hmm. and I didn't know anything about VPNs back then, what I used to do, I had a study group, right? I would first learn how to configure the VPN. Then I would go out of the room. I would ask my friend, my learning partner, to go and break it for me. Mm -hmm. Like make some configuration changes, make something here and there, mm -hmm. and break it for me. I would come back and I would time myself. I have five minutes to fix it. Yeah. And the way to do that, you cannot look at running config. The way to do that is do a conditional debug, look at the show commands to see what could be broken. That's how you learn. Yep. Because yes, in a perfect world, everything is working fine. But when it's not, you have to know how to troubleshoot. Absolutely. And that's how I learn. I would ask my friend to break it for me and time myself. I have five minutes to to fix it. Absolutely. You know what? That dovetail, that gave me a great idea that we just mentioned right there. So two things you said. So number one, at the CCNA level, like you said, it's really important to lab things up and get that experience. Now somebody might say, well, when I take the CCNA, you know, 95% of the questions are multiple choice, drag and drop. There might be, you know, two or three or four simulations in there. Why do I really have to lab stuff up? Well, keep in mind, why are you getting a CCNA in the first place? It's probably because you either want a job or you want a promotion at your current job, which means when you put that CCNA logo on your resume, people are going to assume that you can do things. Not that you just have a bunch of head knowledge, but you can get into their lab and do CCNA level tasks. And if you haven't lab stuff up, if all you did was memorize stuff and create flashcards from a book and that was it, you're gonna be real stressed when you get that job if they give it to you and you get your first hands-on task. That's one thing. You mentioned break fix. And I was just thinking to myself, well, you know, if, if I had a friend or somebody I knew who knew networking and who was willing to do that for me. It's a study group, right? Or a study group, exactly. How would I incorporate INE's lab environment with that? And I thought, here's a great way that you could do that pull up one of our labs, so going back to my OSPF example, pull up one of our OSPF labs, get it working to the way you want. Now, as a caveat, vast majority of our labs are good for an hour, right? So when you start up a lab, it's good for an hour, then it automatically stops. So get that lab working to where you want within an hour, and then before the hour is up, copy all of the configs into a text file, right? Then send those text files over to your friend your friend can make some modifications in the text file, send it back to you. You can restart the lab and then just, you know, select all, copy, select paste. all, paste it into your routers and stuff. And now it's broken. Your friend is the one who broke it. They didn't actually have to log into the equipment. You just pasted in the text files that they gave you that was broken. And now you can troubleshoot it. So that's, that's one idea. All right. So I think we're coming down to the wire here. So let's see what other questions. There was a good question here. Um, this is sort of an interesting question. I, I don't really know, I don't have any experience with AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, let's, I'll just ask this of you, and if you don't, then we can just move on. But HJT from YouTube asks, what is the future of networking careers with the emergence of AI? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, AI is, is coming up in a big way, but again, you need to know to do anything with the AI. Like for example, I'll give you a simple example of the chat GPT. Mm -hmm. um, a few days back, 
I asked a question about multicast. In the chat GPT? In the chat GPT. Okay. And it ga I asked a question about uh, what are the quick ways to troubleshoot multicast in an SD access environment. Mm. It gave me a bunch of show commands that I could use. Now, obviously, it doesn't do it for you. Mm -hmm. It just tells you the show commands. Now, I need to go and do the show commands and I need to look at it to identify a problem, right? If I don't know it, then how will I identify anything? Yeah. So the AI complements you, doesn't replace you. Yeah, you have to know, know what to ask it and how to direct it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. we're not the Terminator state just yet, so. All right, I think we got time for a couple more questions. Uh, let's see here. So we answered that. Good luck on me pronouncing this name, but it's a sort of a good question for you, Rohit. All right, so I'm going to try my best here. Uh, Goffin Simong Sekaris from LinkedIn asks a question for Rohit, specifically for you. When you are studying for the lab, normally how many hours do you study per day and how many days in the week? So it depends on, like for me, to start studying. I'm, I'm very lazy. What? Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah, I'm lazy. So I need to book my lab exam to even start studying. I mean, back in the days you could book it eight months in advance. Now I believe you cannot, it's like two or three months or something like That's that. That's it. Okay. I think so. But back in the days you could book it like way in advance. So I need to book my lab so I know that, okay, you know what, now I have no choice. I have to study. So I used to book my lab exam and then backtrace it from there. So skip the last month and then backtrace from there. What I would do, because I was working also while studying for my CCIE, mm -hmm. so it's not that my boss would tell me that, hey, you have six months of leave, paid leave, and you can study. That never really happens. Right. You still have to do your 8, 10, 12 hours of work and then still have the capability or the willpower to practice. Right. So like I said earlier that I'm a morning person. So I would wake up at 4, 4.30. I don't have to practice for 8 hours a day. What you need to do is plan way ahead. What I would do is go to the blueprint of Cisco. Mm -hmm. First download that. What are the list of topics in that? Then I would look at what topic says deploy or configure. Focus on that. See, there are two ways. One is first to achieve the CCIE, then to gain all the remaining knowledge. For example, I'll give you an example of way back in when I did my first CCIE. So when I was studying for CCIE, there was a really amazing book, which is still amazing. Is the TCPIP Volume 1 and Volume 2 by TCIP Jeff Illustrated? By Jeff Doyle, yeah. uh, TCPIP Volume 1 and 2. That book is like 2,000 pages each book. So that's 4,000 pages. I finished the whole 4,000 pages in one day. What? Now I'll tell you how. Okay. Out of the 4,000 pages, 3,800 pages were irrelevant to me. I'll tell you why. Because they were all packet headers, uh, going in depth about TCP packets, that's not going to be tested in the lab exam. What the lab exam is going to test is how to configure OSPF. So I skipped all of that temporarily for my lab exam. So I was a smart learner. But how did you decide how much time every day to So put in? coming back to that, what I did was um, I would spend one hour every day Monday to Friday, like one hour of actual proper studying where I would spend 20 to 30 minutes on reading a stuff. So I don't take a big topic. I take a small topic. Let's say BGP attributes. I would read about that. Then I would lab it up. So I would take one, one topic every day and finish that off on the weekends, Saturdays or Sundays, one day in the weekend, I would spend eight to 10 hours. So let's say if I'm practicing on Saturday, then Sunday I would spend time with family. That's what I would do. I did that for six to eight months. Yes, one month before my lab exam, I would spend more time. So maybe three hours on weekdays and uh, both Saturday, Sunday, eight, eight hours. Yeah. 
So one month before my lab. And it's, it's really going to be unique to every individual because some people learn and, and or retain at different rates than other people. Yeah. So, yeah. So you're a prodigy. So, you know, we'll just sort of shoot for the sky there and see what happens. But uh, so that's about it, everybody. So I think we have to wrap it up here. Uh, Rohit, Rohit, it's been a real pleasure. It's having been you on a pleasure for me, too. Great. Thank you for, for being with us. And uh, that wraps, wraps up our show for today. So if you enjoyed it, and hopefully you did, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to our feeds on social media. Lots of exciting things coming in the near future. So until next time, I'm Keith Bogart, and thanks for tuning in. Thank <laughs> you.